436 verses 5 through 10. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. Your care for people and animals alike, O Lord. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. Can be seated and we'll just take a moment to pray for our service. Father, thank you for the privilege of worshiping together. Thank you for this time to prepare our hearts for the message you are sending to us that you have already begun to give to us through our um, time of singing and praise. Father, I ask that you open the ears of our hearts to hear you. I pray, Lord, that we humble ourselves, that not one of us will leave here this morning without receiving a taste of you. Lord, I pray for our children who are in kids' church. I pray for our teachers, that they are imparting to them the words you want them to hear. Lord, I pray for the men who are away at the men's retreat. Father, I just know that you are ministering to them. They always come back with these amazing stories of how you are working in their lives. Father, we anticipate hearing those stories. And we anticipate the work you are doing there and the work you are about to do in our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray for Sharon, who's going to speak this morning. I thank you for the words you've given to her. I thank you that she has a heart to bring glory to you. I thank you for the song we sang about how you are beautiful and your face is all we seek. And may we see your face this morning. Jesus' name, amen. So early in April, I was talking to Pastor Randy. I came in to talk to him about Healing Hearts, the ministry that, that I am involved in. Most of you probably have heard a little bit at least about that. And there were some things going on. I'm not going to get into all of it right now, but it was really obvious that God had a plan. There was something big going to be happening, and I still believe that this is all part of it, too. Um, I was talking to him about all of that and how to get it more into the community, how to get it more into all the other churches, that sort of thing. And I told him that I already said yes to God. I don't know what my part in it is, but I say yes. And then he said, well, what if I give you my one of my sermon times in May and you can share your story and you can talk about walking in freedom. And I had just finished saying that I just said yes to God. So <laughs> I couldn't really say no. Um, there was a little part of me, though, that was thinking, you know, this was early April. It was almost two months ago. And May, that sounded pretty far away. And we still had to pass it by Pastor Angel. And sometimes Pastor Andy forgets stuff. <laughs> but as you can see, he didn't forget this time. And I really do think that God has a message that he wants me to share with all of you. And even more than that, it was something that I needed to stop and think about. It's the stuff that I know is true and the things that, that, I, that I believe, but sometimes you get distracted by life about all the, with all the things that are going on. And I needed to stop and think about what walking in freedom really means and remember and get serious about what I know is true. When I think about my own story, I kind of think about it in two parts. And the first is going from having no hope to having hope. And when I say it that way, it doesn't sound like such a big deal. But I'm going to share some of my story with you. And I really, I really pray that God will use my words as inadequate as they are to help you to see what that means and hear the meaning behind what I'm actually saying. Because God is way too big and too holy and too merciful and too full of grace. He's too everything for words to really describe what he can do in a life. And I really want you to, I really, really want you to get from go, what it means to go from no hope to hope. I want you to see how big that is and what an awesome work of God's mercy and grace it really is. And then when I think of the second part of my story, it's moving from, from being saved, knowing I'm forgiven, um, I'm doing okay, I'm walking with God. Going from that to getting a whole lot closer to what God really means when he tells us to live in freedom. There's a quote from Charles Swindoll. I have a book, and it's called something like Charles Swindoll's Book of Illustrations or something like that. And I don't read it so that I have quotes. I just read it because I 
like to read stuff and it's interesting and it's kind of a weird thing for somebody to just read for fun. But I really like it. Um, there's a quote that he put in that one. When I read it, it kind of describes to me the struggle that I have trying to get across to all of you the enormity of what I'm talking about, going from hopeless, hopelessness to freedom. He said, some may have lived in the realm of freedom so long that they've forgotten what it was like to be enslaved in the lost estate Paul describes in Romans 6, 2, when he says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? If so, the following words will help. It is my earnest conviction that everyone should be in jail at least once in his life, and the imprisonment should be on suspicion rather than proof. It should last for four months, it should seem hopeless, and preferably the prisoner should be sick half the time. Only by such imprisonment does he learn what real freedom is worth. I kind of got it when he said that. It, it reminded me of what I had been thinking when I was thinking, what can I say to people to make them get what this really means? So when I was growing up, I just never felt like I was good enough. I never felt like I fit in. I felt like I was alone, I felt unlovable. And I turned to relationships to get that validation. I wanted someone to make me feel like I was good enough and that I was lovable. And I lived a very promiscuous lifestyle when I was younger. I was almost begging for that attention and for someone to love me. But the more that I acted that way, the lower I felt. And then the lower I felt, the more I wanted the attention. So it was a vicious cycle. And it never ended, and it just kept pulling me lower and lower and further out of control. When I was 20, I found out that I was pregnant. I was living with a boyfriend at the time, and things seemed to be going pretty good. But about a month before the baby was born, I got home from work one day, and he wasn't there. He had moved out while I was at work, and he moved in with some other girl. And I was, I was devastated at the time. I was eight months pregnant, and I was alone and scared. And another man had just proved to me what I always felt about myself, that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't, I wasn't lovable. But within a few weeks, I was, just, I was with someone else, and life went on. The baby was born, and when he was a few months old, we moved in with this new guy. And we got along pretty well for the first few months that we were seeing each other. But once we moved in together, reality set in. We really didn't have, we didn't seem to have a whole lot in common. We fought a lot. And I wasn't getting that attention that I needed. Looking back now, I know there was no amount of attention I could have got that would have been enough. Because it was something inside of me that was broken. It wasn't anything that anybody else was doing. It was me. So I went back to my old ways, flirting with everybody, um, and generally just begging for more attention. And I got attention. And when we'd been together for not quite two years, I found out I was pregnant. And it wasn't his, it wasn't my boyfriend's. And he knew it, it was impossible, it couldn't possibly be his. And he told me that I had a choice. I could either get rid of it or get him. And I, I was terrified. I never had meant for anything to get that far out of control. I had a two-year-old son by then. I was working in a minimum wage job, and I was scared, and I didn't know what to do. So I chose to have an abortion. And I knew what that meant. It wasn't just a fetus. It wasn't a piece of tissue. I had a son already, so I knew what was growing in there was a baby. There, I couldn't kid myself about it. So I just didn't think about it. I didn't look any further ahead than what was happening right in front of me. I had a big problem, and this seemed like a solution. And I'm telling you all right now, abortion is not a solution. It's never, ever a solution. It's the beginning of a whole lot of heartache and shame and guilt and regret, and it's a choice that you can never change. Once you've done it, you can't, you can't take it back. If I thought that I was low and unlovable before that, it was confirmed at this point. I hated myself, I hated my boyfriend, I hated everything and everyone around me. 
Inside, I was a hurting, angry mess. But on the outside, I was calm and cool, laid back. Nothing bothered me, because I was really good with the masks. Nobody ever was going to get inside and know what I was feeling and how hurting I really was. Nobody was ever going to know that stuff. I hid it from everyone. And for the next six years or so, that's what life was like. I had no hope. Um, the, absolutely none. There was none. And looking back, it's like there was a black cloud hanging over me all the time. There was no joy. There was no peace. There was pain and there was shame and there was anger. There was regret. And then I started this new job and my new boss was a Christian and she talked about her faith. But she talked about Jesus and I nodded and smiled and had absolutely no clue what she was talking about. Because I had never been to church, I'd never been to Sunday school, I didn't have a clue. But I knew that she meant what she was saying. And I knew that for her, it was good. And then she started an after-school program at my son's school. And he started going to it. And then one day, he came home, and he said, guess what, Mom? Today I asked Jesus to come and live in my heart. I thought it was really cute. I didn't understand what it meant at all. And then he started asking me questions, questions about God and about Jesus. Like I said, I'd never been to church before. I'd never been to Sunday school. I, never, I didn't know anything. So Susan had, my boss, Susan, had been asking me if I wanted to come to church. And so finally I said yes, because I thought it was a good chance for me to learn some stuff so I could answer Josh's questions. Because I wanted more for him. I wanted better for him, and I didn't want him to be like me. So we came here. Pastor Angel was talking that day, and he stood up here. And I was sitting right over there, and I was looking at him. He, to me, he was Angel from basketball. He played basketball with my husband. He was this competitive guy, seemed like a nice enough guy. Um, and he stood up here on this stage, and he told us that God forgives, and he told us that God forgives everybody, and God forgives everything. God can forgive no matter what you've done. He can forgive. And probably some of you listening are thinking, wow, that should have given us some hope. That did not give me hope. That made me angry. Because... I was looking at him thinking, you have no idea who you're talking to. You have no idea the stuff that I have done. There's no way that God can forgive me. I had this idea of a scale. There's sins that are up to a bit here. You know, God can forgive that stuff. You're getting a little higher. Okay, maybe, you know, if you're a really good person, maybe you'll get forgiven. Mine was off the scale. And there was no hope. There was no way that I could ever be forgiven. And I knew that. That's how I felt. So. And there was no, no way. And how dare he stand up here and tell me that I had hope because I knew it wasn't true. And he was wrong. And so I, I decided I was going to prove it to him. I don't know what I was going to do exactly if I found my proof, but that's what I was going to do. So I went home. I had this big old King James Version Bible, the leather bound with the wooden box. It had never been opened. It was really pretty. Um, <laughs> I got that in, and I, had, I didn't know anything. I figured, you know, it's a book. It must have some kind of an index or con table of contents, something. So I got it out, and I was going to look up forgiveness. And that's what I did. It didn't give me what I wanted. So I was looking up things about forgiveness so that I could prove to him. I don't know if I was planning on marching over to his house with it. I don't know what I was going to do, but that's as far as my thinking had got. I had to prove to him that he couldn't stand up here and give false hope to people and hurt them. What I actually found was God's word. Matthew 18, verses 12 and 13. If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hill and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. I didn't know that God
realize go through his word. I had never heard that. I didn't realize. But that day, as soon as I read those words, I knew absolutely, <coughs> completely, deep down inside of me, knew that God was talking to me. I knew that I was that, that lost sheep and that he came after me and he found me and he brought me back. And then he was rejoicing over me. Nobody had ever rejoiced over me. But I knew that that was true and he was talking to me. And the Bible might as well in that part say, this part I will for sure and, and then have it because I knew when it was written, it was written for me. And you guys are all allowed to read it if you want, but that part, you can read it for me. I knew it. And I was forgiven. And again, words are so inadequate to describe what it's like to have that burden lifted and to have hope, especially when you've never had it. A few years later, God told me that this was going to be my burden for him. This is what he wanted me to do, to let people know that there is hope. That it doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done, that there's hope. That life doesn't have to be dark and ugly and lonely. There's a God that loves us so much that while we were still in the middle of our sin, he sent his son to die for us so that we could be with him. Even with all our dirt and our muck and our ugliness, with all that stuff still attached, he loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us always. He loves us forever, no matter what. What I think of as part two of my story is where the real freedom comes in. The definition of freedom is the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. So we'll fast forward five years or so here. Even though I knew that God had forgiven me for my past, I still wasn't living as a free person. I wasn't, as the definition says, I wasn't acting, speaking, or thinking as I wanted without hindrance or restraint. And don't get me wrong, my life, after finding out that I was forgiven by God, was immeasurable, immeasurably better than what my life was before. There's no comparison at all. I was walking with him. I was doing my best to follow him. I was here all the time. People knew me. I was doing stuff for God. It was great. I loved it and I loved life. But I wasn't completely trusting God. If you'd asked me at the time, I would have said I was because I had confessed my sin to him. I believed that I was forgiven, that he forgave me. I was following him. I was doing what I felt I was supposed to be doing. But my past was still a secret. And that's, for me, that was what the key was. I hadn't told anybody. I couldn't let anybody get too close because they might find out. I couldn't let anybody really see me, completely see who I am, because somehow they would just know. And I was still living with the shame and the guilt of what I had done. And I was so afraid that someone was going to find out. If the word abortion was ever said, I would break, in, break out into a sweat. I remember being at Peggy's house one day, and we were doing a Bible study, and we were just taking turns reading from it. And I could see ahead in the section I was going to be reading. The word abortion was in there, and I was in a sweat in the Bible study with like five friends, none of whom knew my story, but just to have to read that word in front of people. It was like I thought as soon as it came out of my mouth, the lights were going to flash or something. People were just going to know. But then God said that it was time for me to start helping other women realize that there's hope and that God loved them and he wanted more for them. Women who were like me, who were hurting and who were hopeless. And I argued with him because I knew that there was no way I could do that without telling my story. And I told God he had the wrong, the wrong person. And then I told him that he, if he wanted me to do that, he was going to have to change my heart. Because I had no intention of telling anybody. Me and God, we were good. People, there's no way. People don't forgive as, as readily as God does. People aren't as merciful as God is. And I wasn't going to tell him. I told him that he was going to have to do something inside of me before it was going to happen. And so with that invitation, he did start to work in me. And what happened was that I realized I wanted to do what 
he wanted me to do more than I wanted to stay safe. So I started talking, and I told my story, and God used it. And then I told my story again, and God used it again. 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And when I read that now, I can see I was not living as someone who was free. My secrets were holding me back from serving God the way that he wanted me to serve. I couldn't love people the way he wanted me to love them because I couldn't let them get too close to me. I was too afraid. So the second part of my message is really to just let go of those things. Whatever it is that holds you back from really serving him and obeying him, just let it go. The shame, guilt, anger, if it's unforgiveness, if it's secret sins, whatever it is that holds you back from God, that thing that keeps a wall between you and other people, just <laughs> let it go and give it to him. I couldn't even tell people about God's mercy, and to me that was the, the biggest attribute that I had seen of God's in my life, is his mercy, and I couldn't tell people, because to do that I would have to tell them my truth, my story. I'd have to share where he had brought me from, and I just couldn't do that at the time. John 8, 31-32 says, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God's word is the truth, and he tells us in it how he wants us to live in the world. And hiding, that's not it. That's not what he says to do. And I'm telling you that until I was ready to tell the whole truth about myself, I was far from being free. I had to be willing to obey whatever it was that God was going to ask of me. And it, for other people, it doesn't mean that he's going to tell you to come up here and stand up here and spill everything and tell everybody all your whole life story. That's what God told me to do. It doesn't mean that's what he's going to ask of anybody else. But those secrets, they are killers. As long as you let fear have a hold on you, the enemy is going to use it to keep you from serving God the way that God would have you serve him. It's going to keep you from being the person that God created you to be. And we serve a big, big God. The God who's on our side, he's the one who created all of the stars, the billions and billions of them in the universe. He's the one who created the water. He made the, the oceans. He got the water and he put all the water in the ocean and then he made all of the cool and disgusting things that live in it. <laughs> it's big. That is big. He's the God who made the sun and the moon and the earth. And that God, that is the one that's got our back. And he's not going to make you do it alone. Whatever it may be, whatever that thing is that that you've been holding back from doing because of fear or shame or guilt or whatever it is. He's not going to make you do it alone because he promised that he's with us wherever we go. And for anyone who's resigned to life being what it is, thinking that your sins are too bad or you're not smart enough to have anything to offer or you don't know enough to be of any use to God, I can tell you that if God can take me Someone whose comfort zone is way, way at the back, mouth shut, watching what goes on. I like doing the PowerPoint stuff because I'm up there, I can see everything, and I'm too high up for people to have close contact with. And sometimes that's my comfort zone. So if God can take me and make me willing to come up here in front of all of you, and this is a lot easier to do in front of strangers, because they're not going to see me again. You guys, you see me all the time. Some of you see me pretty much every day. If he can make me willing to come up here and put everything in there and show you everything, the ugly corners of my closet, that stuff that people usually hide, he, he said, get up there and you tell them. If he can make me do that, if he can do enough healing in me for this to happen, he can do it for anybody. I think that's the message he wanted me to share today. First, that there is hope. 
and second, to move free. All that junk, it weighs way too heavy. You don't need it. You can give it to him because he can handle it. Before I end, I want to mention healing hearts again. For any of you ladies who have anything from your past that you need to deal with, I've got two Bible studies that I do with people through healing hearts. The first is called Binding Up the Brokenhearted, and it's a Bible study for women who've been through abortion. And the second is called The Hem of His Garment, and it's for women who just need to deal with stuff from the past because we've all got hurts, and we've all got sins, and we've all got issues that we need to deal with. And they're both 10 week Bible studies where you can start dealing with all of it in a safe place. So if anybody's interested any time, and I don't just mean today, but any time, because I have these going on all the time, come see me. Or if you know anybody who needs some help dealing with some stuff, send them to come see me. And just one last thing before I go. I wanted to share a scripture that I keep coming back to whenever I need to remember why I do this stuff. I don't usually come up here and talk in front of all of you, other than doing announcements and little things here and there. But I do go out and talk to other groups, women's groups, or I've, done, I've talked to the team lots a couple times, or whatever. And it's scary. Like I said, my comfort zone is looking at the backs of your heads, not at the front. But there's a scripture. It's from, it's from my daily Bible, da daily study Bible for women in the New Living Translation, and it's the only one that I've seen that says it exactly this way. And when I read it in this particular Bible, it really, it really struck me. So I wanted to share that with you. It, it just, it means something to me. It's from Philippians 1, verse 20. It says, For I live in eager expectation and hope that I will never do anything that causes me shame, but that I will always be bold for Christ and that my life will always honor Christ, whether I live or die. And that's, that's my hope, that I will be able to be bold for Christ, and doing, in doing this, that's what makes me not have shame, if you know what I mean. Whether I live or die, what, whatever anybody's reaction to it is, this is what I do because God says so. And I'm completely fine with everybody forgetting who was up here talking as long as you go away knowing what God can do in a broken life and as long as he gets all the glory for it. Okay. So that is my message for today. Um, let's just pray for a minute. Father God, I thank you that you are God and that there is no other. I thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you are the Alpha and the Omega, that you are everything, Lord, and that you are the God who loves us so much that you sent Jesus to save us. I thank you that you don't want us to live in that muck and mire, in, in shame and in sin, that you have given us a way to be free. I pray, God, that the people will hear what your message is, not so much my words, Lord, but but your words as your spirit goes through them. Touch each heart and each life, Lord, and change what needs to be changed. Give people the courage to know that when you are backing them up, they can do anything, that they don't have to stay the way that they are. Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for helping each one of us live the way that you would have us live. You help us each and every day, and I thank you so very much. And I just pray, God, that you would touch hearts today, that people would leave here knowing you and loving you a little bit more than when they came here this morning. I pray it in Jesus.